All right, so we're looking at norming asset management. Norming asset management is what we call an SDK, or Software Development Kit Module. And what that means to you folks as an existing Sage 300 slash ACPAC customers is that this module was built exclusive for the Sage 300 ERP system. And that has a few benefits to you as existing customers. One of which is the fact that it runs under the system manager which consists of both a common services component, which is where we have our fiscal calendar, we have multi-currency, we have the optional fields, and also the tax services, so that the tax calculations are properly accrued for fixed asset acquisitions. It also supports the administrative services, which means that any security groups, if you're using this as a profile to restrict access to the other modules within Sage 300, Norming Asset Management will just appear as another Sage 300 module, and you'll be able to create a profile for access rights among all the different feature sets, and then attach that to an existing group ID for users that belong to that security profile. It also means that we utilize the land pack licenses for multi-user access. So based on the number of users you already have in the system, you can plug in the asset management component and if you've got five land pack licenses, then up to five concurrent users will be able to access norming asset management as well. So you only have to license the core module itself, and the multi-user licenses will be uh, supported under the existing land pack licenses. We call the system asset management because it actually consists of four different modules. The core module is what we call asset accounting. This is your fixed asset subledger where you acquire assets, dispose of old assets, track the movement of assets, and also depreciate your assets. The system also includes the ability to do merges and splits of assets where you can take multiple assets and combine them into one asset for accounting purposes. It also means that you can split assets apart if you want to create multiple assets for accounting purposes. There's a number of different adjustment entries that we'll review with you. And uh, you also have the option to do standard reporting that we'll review. Optionally, you can include leased assets. So the asset leasing module handles both what we call lease in assets, where you lease an asset from an outside vendor and set up a schedule of payments through accounts payable for assets that you lease either under a capital or operating lease for your own internal use. And we also have a lease out contract where you own the asset and you rent that out to a customer and the billing payment then creates AR invoices. Uh, thirdly, we have a maintenance module where you can track the maintenance expenses to keep assets in good productive order. And then finally, an asset tracking module which has your barcode interface with the ability to create asset labels if you want to use handheld scanners to either count the assets or track the movement of assets. And then as I mentioned, there's a series of standard crystal reports that come with the applications, and we'll review those as we go. Just to highlight one of the key features before we go through some of the setup options, the reports themselves in many cases have sort and selection criteria for things like category, location, cost center, and group. So it's not necessary for you to embed a large number of segments within your asset ID numbers because these are standard sort and selection options within the reports themselves. And as I mentioned, we'll come back and review these reports towards the end of the session today. So in terms of the setup, we'll review this so you get a key sense of the integration between the asset management system and the rest of Sage 300 ERP because that is one of the defining attributes of this particular solution. Out of the box, we would, of course, integrate with General Ledger to validate all of the fixed asset transactions from the fixed asset subledger into asset control accounts on the balance sheet, as well as your depreciation and amortization expense transactions to the income statement. And then optionally, we can integrate with accounts payable so that when you're acquiring new assets, you have two-way integration between the fixed asset subledger and accounts payable. So you can either enter a fixed asset acquisition, and based on the posting of that transaction, we will create an AP invoice automatically for you. 
or conversely you could set up an AP invoice and convert a line from that invoice into an acquisition entry within fixed assets. We integrate with accounts receivable so that when you're disposing of an asset, you don't have to just write it off to the GL. You could sell that asset and generate an AR invoice to record that transaction. We integrate with inventory control so that it's possible to move fixed assets from a fixed asset balance sheet account over to inventory control. And then you could sell the asset through order entry if you wanted to do that. And lastly, we integrate with the purchase orders module so that if you raise requisitions for your capital asset acquisitions, we can receive against the purchase orders and that receipt of the PO can also give rise to an acquisition entry within fixed assets. We do support Canadian tax pooling if you want to track capital cost allowance within the system. To be honest, most customers simply track their book values and leave the CCA and tax values to their outside accountants. The asset numbers can be up to nine segments and 72 alphanumeric characters. So as I mentioned previously, you can embed all of this different setup information like cost center category, location, group, account set as a segment within the asset ID. But typically our customers would only use three or four of those segments to track some of the key fields. And then the last segment might be an auto numbering segment. This is optional, but a lot of people use it to maintain a, normal, a, a numerical sequence of assets by category or by cost center so that when you run your asset listing, you can always test for completeness. So those are the main setup options in terms of integration and the master file fields. The other setup options give you a sense of the functionality within the application. So here, in, under the account sets, we're demonstrating the integration into the GL chart of accounts. So the asset control accounts on the balance sheet will be validated for every entry within the system. Uh, you don't build assets, so you don't need to worry about work in progress. But of course, the accumulated depreciation will also be tracked. And if you're interested in conforming with the International Financial Reporting Standards, or IFRS as they're known, we can keep track of adjustments to cost and accumulated depreciation and record those adjustments in a separate account or bucket within the system so that you can go back and trace any movement in the historical costs and net realizable value. And as I mentioned off the top, we can support multi-currency. So if you want to purchase assets in a currency other than Canadian dollars, you can set that up in the system and we will be able to track realized and unrealized gain or loss on exchange. Under the account sets, we have categories. So the purpose of the categories is to allow you to hold additional detail on those assets within the fixed asset subledger. So while you may have an account set for buildings or equipment, within fixed assets you could then categorize the equipment in more detail. So you might have different types of equipment, manufacturing equipment versus office equipment, and then you would roll up both types of equipment category into the default account set for equipment, which would then allocate those to the control account in the general ledger. So that is what the account sets and categories are used for, primarily your statutory financial statement presentation. Then we have groups, and groups are really just a user-defined code with a description that provide another sort and selection option for reporting and tracking against your assets. Typically, the groups would be used for more of a management bias in, in reporting as opposed to statutory financial statement reporting. The location codes is yet another sort and selection option for your fixed asset reporting and tracking. In this case, you can attach a, a file for an image or a document. These attachments could either be bitmaps, JPEGs, PDF, or doc files. And also, we integrate to the GL segments. So this facilitates things like profit center and cost center reporting where you can choose an individual GL segment and then an individual segment code. So it would be possible to roll up the cost and quantity of assets within a particular segment and run a mini balance sheet or income statement by segment, including your asset valuations. And then we have cost centers. 
and cost centers are the income statement side of your fixed asset transactions. These also tie into the GL chart of accounts, but in this case it's the income statement for the recording of your amortization and depreciation expense. And also what we can do is we can allocate this expense on a percentage basis across multiple cost centers or departments. So you can share that cost if you need to. So those are the main setup options. The acquisition codes just highlight the different ways that we can acquire new assets into the system. The more standard way is through an AP transaction, but as I mentioned, we can also support purchase orders for receipts that of uh, new f fixed assets in the system. Um, we can also move inventory into fixed assets, so the two-way integration between fixed assets and inventory. And if you had the project job cost module, you could actually use PJC to create an asset and capitalize it. The depreciation methods are all formula driven and user defined. So as long as you can specify your policy as an algebraic formula, you'll be able to set that up in the system. So let's use straight line method as an example of that. It's a fairly simple algebraic formula, but the reason we give you access to the formula is because in some cases people might use the beginning month valuation versus the end of month valuation or possibly an average of the month to use the as the cost basis for the depreciation calculation. Regardless of which method you use, we allow you to test the calculation within the system to make sure that you're getting an absolute dollar value that matches with your existing spreadsheets. And then the tax pooling, if I turn that on, you could also see the CCA tax classes and we would keep track of recapture or terminal loss against those assets. You can specify which periods within a year you want to run depreciation, so you don't have to run it every month if you don't want to. The classifications have to do with the CCA classes. The capitalization budget is really just a budget for fixed asset acquisitions. It doesn't have anything to do with the GL account budget in the general ledger, but this is strictly a way for you to keep track of your purchases against the capitalization budget within fixed assets. And if you use the budget code, then we can accumulate your actual expenditures to show you the variance against budget. And there's also a separate report that would detail the individual acquisitions against that budget. Now, because there's a fair amount of detailed information within a fixed asset system, we encourage quite strongly the use of templates to populate all of this setup information in the system so that you don't have to visit each of these fields when you enter a new asset. And this covers off the setup of an asset under a cost center, a category, location, group, account set, and budget code. It also includes the book and tax method, rate, and life for depreciation purposes. And if we look at what's set up within the asset register, this is the actual fixed asset subledger. And the fields that we're populating to keep track of these assets is very close to what you see here within the asset template. So we encourage the use of the templates so that you're not rekeying this information and populating it directly to the asset register. Now that we're looking at the asset register, this is where we keep the rolling calculation of net book value within the system. We will keep track of an original purchase cost plus any adjustments to book value. And that means any increases or decreases through adjustment entries or add-on transaction that we'll talk about in just a minute. This also allows you to keep track of the consumption of an asset if you want to track usage based on a unit of measure. So if the equipment in your manufacturing facility had so many hours of productive use, you could specify what that capacity is, 100,000 hours, and then hours would be your production unit of measure. And you could record the number of hours in use the equipment has been um, used within that month and then just keep track for capacity utilization purposes. The miscellaneous page allows you to hold an insured value, and you could also keep track of the carrier and the policy number. If you're interested in stewardship, we can also assign an individual the responsibility of maintaining or caring for that asset, and you also have some notes and additional information fields. 
Uh, we support the use of optional fields if you have that module within Sage 300 so that you could attach buyer warranty type information to the fixed asset. Here within the asset register we have three more image files that can be attached. Again, they're either bitmap, JPEG, PDF, or doc files. And when you scan and attach uh, a document of any type, it will be visible when you hit the view button. So you could put in the original invoice, an image picture of the asset, uh, maybe certification or inspection documents, whatever you think is relevant to the system. The units page is used primarily with the asset tracking module so that you can track serial numbers and barcodes against the assets. The asset register supports the use of import. So typically we would take your existing Excel sheet and reformat it into the layout that's required for the asset register and then based on that be able to import in your existing assets with their current netbook values into the norming asset management system. If you have master assets and you want to associate other assets as components, you can simply turn on the use of the component feature and then you'll be able to view assets under the master component inquiry window. So this would highlight the main asset and then any component assets that you're keeping track of. So they're associated more for a management reporting or tracking purpose, but each of the components is a unique asset for accounting purposes. And that's different from the merge split that we mentioned previously. When you merge assets together, you're combining one new asset for accounting purposes with one depreciation method rate in life. And then, of course, the opposite of the merge is the split, where we take an asset and break it apart into multiple assets for accounting purposes. The other thing that's important here that we touched on was the asset activity inquiry window. And this will give you an audit trail of all the activities around an asset from the date of acquisition to the current period. And this can include any type of transaction within the system. So that might include an add-on entry where we acquired the asset, but then we added on some additional costs to that asset, and that's an add-on transaction type, where the cost from an invoice is being added to an asset ID. We're not creating a new asset. And all of that can be visible through the Asset Activities Inquiry window. So were there any questions at this point in time before I actually go through a sample transaction? What's the best way to, say, track a project? I think you kind of touched on that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, for example, we approve a project where we're going to spend half a million dollars to, um, I don't know, whatever, install a new plant or something like that. Yep. What's the best way to track against that? Well, you've got two options. If it was a very sophisticated job, you might consider the use of the project and job costing module for Sage 300. And then once you've completed the project, we have that acquisition code. <coughs> Excuse me. Just got a bit of a frog in my throat there, sorry. Um, you could consider the use of project job costing and then convert the completed project into an acquisition or you would use the work in progress account within fixed assets. And the way you would do that is, <clears throat> excuse me, you would, when you create a new asset transaction, let's say um, it's the purchase of new equipment, but you don't want to start depreciating this asset because you just want to capitalize these costs to the balance sheet then instead of <clears throat> saying, um, sorry, you could say new or add-on. And if you say new, we're going to use the template code. And when we come down here, instead of status normal, we would go status whip. You just double click the status column. And this would be recorded into the whip account. So in terms of the account set, you recall that we had the asset control account, which would be where we would capitalize the cost for an asset that was in service. Sorry, excuse me. Or 
if we change the status to work in progress, then it would go into another balance sheet account. So it would be recorded as an asset on the balance sheet, but it would not be depreciable because it's just part of a project where we're going to be capitalizing costs over time. And then when you were ready, you would decide to do a work in progress transfer to move it out of the WIP account into the asset control account. So that's how we would handle the capitalization of costs, just by changing that status from uh, normal to WIP. <clears throat> then we would attach the next available asset number, put in the description of the asset, and because the template is already populated all the other information we want, we would just simply add in the book source value. Let's say it was $15,000. And we could add that as a transaction within the system. Now we could also hit the F9 zoom key. And maybe there was a serial number we wanted to track with that asset. Uh, maybe there was an insured value or there was productive capacity information we wanted to track. So all of this could be then added, any optional field information or the scanning of an attachment. Okay, so all of that could be done during this process if you wanted to. <clears throat> but you would simply add the transaction. It gives me an acquisition control number. And then if I've got the invoice, I would just add the invoice information and save that. So this is where we're creating an, NP, an AP invoice off of an acquisition entry within fixed assets. And when we're ready to post that, we would just go ahead, post the transaction, and it will generate the AP invoice and update the GL control account. So that information will flow automatically. There's no rekeying required. So if we open up the accounts payable invoice batch list, we see an asset management generated invoice batch. <clears throat> and the transaction invoice has been recorded the amount that's set up as a payable against the vendor we bought from, and the debit goes to an account we call AP Clearing. The drill down support that's standard within Sage 300 is supported between the core modules and the fixed asset ledger, so we can drill from accounts payable back to the source entry within fixed assets. Okay, so that's the AP invoice side of the entry that's handled. <clears throat> and then we move to the general ledger. And the transaction batch has been created here as well. Today's date, October 28th. And we see the entry for debiting the asset to the control account in the balance sheet. The reference and description, you can customize the information that flows up from the fixed asset subledger for audit trail purposes. And the offset to that is a credit to the AP clearing. So if we combine the entry in accounts payable and general ledger, We've got a credit to the vendor in accounts payable and a debit to AP clearing. And here in the GL, we debit the control account and credit AP clearing. So the AP clearing account does clear. We also have the drill down support from GL back to fixed assets. So again, you can drill back to the source entry if need be. But as you can see, the integration is there, the audit trail is maintained, and it's visible from GL or AP back into fixed assets. So that's the main uh, acquisition entries. We've touched on the adjustments. <clears throat> You've also got, of course, depreciation. So in the system, this becomes a much easier process because rather than having to go into a spreadsheet and update columns and rows, you simply come in here and hit the process button and it will generate your depreciation expense calculation, update accumulated depreciation, and create the batch for those entries to be posted to the general ledger. So at any point in time, you'll know that you have up-to-date netbook values. Within the system, we allow you to do a projection. So if you're interested in knowing what uh, the depreciation expense in your assets is going to have on your income statement this year or next year, you can do a projection and find out what that looks like. You can also do some sensitivity analysis by changing the method of depreciation and running a projection with a new policy to see what impact that change in policy might have on your income statement. And then the disposal entries allow you to go in and write off your assets, but we don't assume that you just want to write those off to the GL. So what you can do is either do a GL transaction to remove it from the books, 
or you could sell the asset, or you could move it into inventory control. So you've got three different disposal entry types that are supported within the system. And you can either do one-off entries, or you can do bulk disposals to dispose of a range of assets. We've touched on merge split. Uh, periodic processing, there's a couple things here I'll touch on. We have a built-in number change utility, so you can move an asset from an old asset ID to a new asset ID, and all of the history will move with that. And then you've got your year-end processing to close off the accounts in the current year. The revaluation batch for currency purposes is here. Uh, that's only if you want to update the rate of exchange used for financial statement presentation, if that's required. In terms of reporting, you've got a couple of options. You've got the standard crystal reports. The most common report would be the asset schedule. You could run this in summary or detail, and you have options as to how you might want to group that. Let's say you wanted to group it by account set. So this would simply show you a breakdown of the assets tied into the financial statement control accounts. <clears throat> and this is what some people call the continuity schedule because we're showing your opening cost, your additions, adjustments, disposals during the year, and then your closing cost against your opening depreciation, year-to-date reversals, disposals, the total accumulated, and the difference between the two being your closing net book value. So this might potentially be used as support for the note to the financial statements. So that's the asset schedule in summary. If you run it in detail, let's say by category, then you'll get a breakdown for each individual asset as to its roll forward from opening cost to closing cost, opening depreciation to closing accumulated depreciation, and your net book value. In this case, we can add the description of the asset and its acquisition date on the schedule if that's desired. So these are standard crystal reports. So as you may or may not know, once in crystal, you can make this a PDF and email it to people. You could convert it to an XLS file or some other format that might be more usable. So that's a standard crystal report called the asset schedule. There's also an asset listing report that you could sort and select by, let's say, first of all, location, and then maybe by category. And this would give you similar types of information uh, in terms of detailed asset information. So this is broken out first by location and then by category. And this has the description, its acquisition date, cost center category group, its original book value, what might have been depreciated so far year to date and accumulated from the acquisition date, and then the net book value. This also would show for any disposed assets a gain or loss on disposal. So that's what we have here. And you'll see that the status would be disposed. Okay. <clears throat> and it shows the capital gain or loss on disposal. So that's the asset listing report. Uh, one more report quickly is asset history. This allows you to go in by transaction type. So if you just wanted to see a listing of acquisitions within a certain date range, you could run this report and it would show you a breakdown of those. The capitalization analysis is just the budget code tied to a list of acquisitions to show you how you're doing against budget. So it'll list the total acquisitions and then the difference between that and budget. So those are the main crystal reports. We also have something called Info Explorer that allows you to look at the assets in multi-dimensional cubes and then build dashboards of information. So this would allow you to get a breakdown of assets by category and location, but let's say then you just want to highlight by location first. You drag location over here, and then you want to filter and say, I just want to see location one. So you would filter the assets and just see a cube by that. And then if you wanted to save that as a new report, you could say, I want to take a copy of that view. So that's a copy of my assets. And then I rename that to say it's um, assets by location. And you just save that as a new report. And then the norming asset one that we had here, we would come back here 
and eliminate the filter, show all. And we go back to the original cube that I had there, but I've also now got a new cube called Assets by Location or a new report. Okay, So you can play around with that filtering, formatting, graphing, whatever you want to do. And it's a quick and easy way for you to keep track of the assets. It also has the ability to drill down from the, um, <clears throat> the cube itself into the um, Sage 300 information. So you could drill from the cube back into the asset register if you wanted to see information within a Sage 300 context. Okay, so it's got a number of different features, and if you double-click on a cell, it'll show you a breakdown of entries against that account. Okay, so that just gives you a sense of what you're able to do with these cubes and how to utilize them for management-type reporting. So that covers off an overview of the asset accounting module, its key functionality, some of the reporting capabilities. Were there any questions about what you've seen? Um, the, so the Info Explorer, is that, is that kind of a standard inclusion? Yes, uh, the Info Explorer, it comes at no charge with this cube already built for you. Uh, so like the dashboards and these queries are already pre-built. So you can continue to use this to your advantage for as long as you wish. If you decided that you wanted to customize the query behind the cube, then you would have to license a, uh, a full version, like a programming version that allows you to build queries. And that's $400 per workstation. But we give you a standard cube that you can generate multiple reports off. You can graph, you can filter, you can format the data any way you want. So actually the Info Explorer is a, uh, like a different software, but it's the preview is free. That's right. Yeah, what you see here um, with the asset accounting and these dimensions is what you get for free. Yep. And actually, now that you mention it, there's other cubes that come for free, like GL, AR, AP cubes. There's an order entry cube in here. So you could utilize it with data in the other Sage 300 modules that you have as well. So actually, like, but Info Explorer, it's a, it's a product made by a different company or it's made by your company? Uh, it's a product made by Orchid Systems, which is another development partner that we represent, actually. We, we act as a distributor for multiple development partners. Norming is one of them, and Orchid Systems is another one. Okay. So, so these products are, are linked together now. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to buy a license for that, we can create our own cubes and give it to everybody in our backpack environment. Correct? That's, That's correct. Right. And, and even with the free version, you can send these cubes out. These cubes are accessible by anybody in the system, either inside ACPAC or outside ACPAC, because they're all separate okay. cube files. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, also, I think uh, that you have in uh, uh, periodic processing, you have a repair database. Yes. Your database is separate of ACPAC's SQL database? You have your own database, or is just what that's going to do? Uh, this just, um, sometimes if you're entering information or you imported it in and the index is out of whack, the repair database will try to restore the index in the table. But the norming asset management data is stored in the same database as the rest of ACPAC. So, so you when have your you... own table, but this, this uh, program just going to clean up your own table, not the rest of ACPAC table. That's right. That's right. You'd have to run data integrity with a dump and load or your own repair within Sage 300. Yeah. Cool. So also the data integrity is not cov it's covering or is not covering like ACPAC data integrity your, your uh, module? No, it'll cover our module as well. And the reason we can show that through system information is the asset management is, is activated within the same company database, and it's in the shared same uh, program directory. So it's going to appear as um, another module within data integrity. Okay. Yeah. 
So think of it as just another Sage 300 ACPAC module. That's really the way that it's designed to be. So Robert, those those uh, indexes you're talking about, those are SQL Server indexes? Um, the repair, yeah, it will uh, would either be SQL or it would be um, pervasive if, uh, if it was a pervasive database. Okay. It's just restoring the index in the table, regardless of which database you're in. Got it. Okay. <clears throat> and the addition, the integration with ARAP and ICR standard for your product is not some add add-on. No, that's right. Everything that you've seen here is what you get out of the box. There's no customizations in here. Robert, uh, you haven't, uh, you have not shown us the integration with PO. Can you just briefly explain the integration with purchase order? Yep, sure. Um, with the acquisition entry, <clears throat> what you would do is you would choose, so let's create a new entry here, so new equipment purchase. Uh, sorry. And what we'll do in this case is we'll just change. Now, what I might have to do is go in and create a PO if you want to actually see the flow. But I would change the acquisition code to acquire with PO. And then it's going to use that acquisition code. And then based on the vendor, we would look for a PO. And we would receive against that PO. So if there's a receipt, and we pick up the receipt. And then it would say, OK. This is multiple assets by quantity. Do you want to convert? Go ahead and convert. And it creates the next available asset number and pulls that in. So you've actually created the PO before going into the screen? Yes, you have to have a PO and a receipt number against that PO in order to create the acquisition entry. So and the when assumption. When you created the PO, it wasn't a fixed asset number that you put in. It's just a. Um, a non-stock item? Yes. Oh? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, because we create the asset ID number once it comes into fixed assets. Okay. Now, if you wanted to override that, you could manually override the asset number if you wanted to have a different series of numbers for things that you're buying through purchases. That would be up to you. <clears throat> okay. So, Yena, does that mean, based on everything you've just asked, does that mean that it'll integrate properly with that PO workflow software we were looking at? Yes, it will. Okay. But there will be an additional step, with it, which is this uh, asset management acquisition entry screen. Correct. Correct. Yeah, okay. That makes sense. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like that. And then it's, and then that's essentially part of accounting. Okay. Okay. Was there anything else that we needed to talk about or demonstrate for so you Jeremy, today? Jeremy, from your perspective, like the various methods by which you depreciate your assets, do you, do you see kind of that being uh, available inside this product? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it looks like that depreciation method is, the, or the mechanism is sufficiently robust so that we can probably put in anything, any of those crazy things we do. Yep. As long as you can express it as a formula, you can put anything you want in there. And we give you the programming tools here to do if-then-else and different types of programs. Yeah. yeah. And I've got Sebastian. He can figure it out. There you go. <laughs> we, all, we have our own custom, custom Sebastian. Now, now, Robert, just to put you a little bit on the spot here, um, we're also, um, like, how does this stack up against, like, the Sage bad product mm -hmm. um, of the overall, I guess, positioning. Yep. Our, uh, our product was built specifically for Sage 300 ERP. So it's the tightest integration you can have. We run in the same database. Sage FAS has an external database. We use land pack licenses for multi-user access. You have to pay for multi-user licenses in addition to your land packs when you buy Sage FAS. We have the same interface from a screen and navigation standpoint, Sage FAS has a different interface, different navigation. So the user training curve is generally a little steeper when you use Sage FAS. We have the option to add maintenance if that ever becomes an issue. 
SageFaz does not offer a maintenance module with the, the fixed asset system. Um, we also have a leasing component. If that ever became an issue, SageFaz does not support asset leasing. So we are fully integrated, use the land packs, same database, same look and feel, and um, SageFaz is a different application that was built to be a generic fixed asset system that integrates into multiple ERPs. Those are the main differentiating points. Right. And what about support for the product? Um, how does that work? Uh, well, typically they would come to you as their local business partner to get frontline support. We can certainly assist you with implementation services. Uh, we provide level one support to the partners through our office here in Toronto. And uh, level two would go back to norming if it was something beyond you know, that needed either a hot fix or just something more technical. What's the um, typical implementation timing? Uh, generally speaking, we would ballpark it at 40 hours of uh, service time to get the asset management system in place. The main activity is getting your existing spreadsheet information up to date and then formatting that to do the import into the asset register. So we would actually create an import template in your existing Excel sheet off your current asset information. And generally, so actually, in that, mm -hmm. so actually in that 40 hours, we give you the Excel and you make sure that you're going to actually talk with us to figure out and you're going to create the templates for us and all uh, the configuration? Yes, exactly. And we also go through a process called solution design where we would walk you through the screens in just a little bit more detail than <laughs> I took you through so that you understand the different features, what's available, what you want to use. And that maps to your requirements, which then determines the configuration of the system. You know, and then, of course, we would run a test in, in a test database to make sure that the depreciation numbers are accurate to the penny if you want them that way. And you know, just make sure that you're clear on the process. So there's a fair amount of time and effort in the setup. But if the setup is done correctly, to maintain the system is not that difficult, and in fact, it'll work very smoothly for you. Okay, it's nice. Okay. Robert, you're showing us version 6.0. Would this be compatible with 2012, or do you have a 2012 version? This version is compatible with 2012. There will be a new version coming out around March of 2014 when the 2014 release comes out. That will be uh, an upgrade to this in terms of some new features, and it will be compatible with version 2012 and the new 2014. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We have, as a gold development partner, we have a commitment to Sage to release within 30 to 60 days after the release of their new version upgrades. Yep. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very, very much good. for your time and attention. I'm going to turn off the recording now.